unidentifiable flying object. The UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Fighting the UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be anything. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of UFO No, your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians. Time to get elevated and speculate all about the UFO landing at Socorro, New Mexico in 1964, where a police officer saw a UFO land. We're going to break it down. We're going to go over the whole thing. I'm flying solo. Ed is not with us. He's got adulting to do. Ed, we miss you. We love you. Thank you for joining the show. We're in the stratosphere. I'm in the stratosphere. Cruising at about 92,000 feet, and it's clear skies, baby. If you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review. Five stars. It looks excellent next to all the other ones. Uh, Hit that subscribe button and the follow button. Catch every single new episode the moment it comes out. Don't miss a thing. As well, click the portal to all things UFO No link to find things, find ways of supporting the show like merch, full of great stuff like hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, whole bunch of stuff. All your favorites telling you, go check it out. We've also got a new merch, merch booth. Uh, I'll have that link in the show notes as well, so you can pick and choose which ones you like. Tag us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter so you can show us your badass and how great you look in your gear. Uh, If you're into Bitcoin, listen on apps like Fountain, earn sats, which are uh, Satoshis, while you listen. 100 million sats make up one Bitcoin, so turn that hours of listening to podcasts into some money. Boost the podcast while you're at it. Last but not least, of course, you can support the podcast by supporting our partners, Clark's CBD Co. Uh, Excellent CBD products. Check it out. Very knowledgeable. That's me and my buddy Casey. We run that thing, and uh, it's great. Scribed, great audible alternative. No credits needed. Just $14.95 a month. You get the full library. 60 days free when you use our link. Check it out. And, of course, Buzzsprout, if you want to start your own podcast, I think everybody should at least... Give it a try. You might not have the chops, but if you're opinionated and you can yak, give it a shot. Uh, if you want to start your own, sign up using our link, and you get a $20 Amazon gift card when you start your own deal. Just for signing up, do it if you want. Add free episodes, all my loyalty, more content like my take on news uh, that's generally not in the corrupt media about AI technology, quantum computing, along with what the government bastards are doing, like NASA, CIA are up to. Join the tinfoil militia. Here's how to do it. You can buy us a Romulan ale or two or three. They're only $5 each, and they're made from only the finest Khaled secretions on the Virnak colony. So go check it out. Leave a note so we can share that on the show and toast to you also on the show. Donate at patreon.com slash UFO no podcast, and also... Lisa, leave us a note, leave comments, join our Discord server, or, of course, you can uh, give a direct donation through PayPal, which is new. I haven't done that before. Put it, again, link in the show notes. Check it out. Every donation gets your name permanently etched on the supporters plaque at HQ. And, yes, I do have a plaque at HQ. And a shout-out on the show. Monthly sustained donations make you an active member with access to your rewards. Every single episode is brought to you by the badass tinfoilists who support this podcast. I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil. Militia. Stop, militia. The tinfoil. Militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. It's a gay bomb, baby. Love them, the severe badasses from the Tinfoil Militia. Join us. We're taking over the world. But now let's get into the episode. Here's the deal. 
Socorro, New Mexico, 1964. There have been a lot of rational, quote unquote, rational explanations like uh, mistaken identity. Maybe it was a helicopter, a plane, maybe a drone. I say that a lot. A weather balloon? Definitely not. I, I don't believe that any time. Well, I shouldn't say any time. I should say most of the time. The weather balloon is uh, I, uh, a premise. Explanation is bullshit. Uh, and that's what the U.S. Air Force and the FBI concluded in this case. Or even a mirage that some people said. A hoax, of course, to attract visitors to the town, which, good argument. Uh, but this UFO landing was witnessed by police officer Lonnie Zamora. And this one by ufologists and a lot of researchers is considered one of the most credible encounters on record. Here's the thing. When you start digging into these tales of UFOs and aliens, every a lot of them, all the big ones, of course, Roswell's, Okoro, all the, oh, it's the most credible. It's the smoking gun. Well, I think it's the most credible that in the case that you have a police officer, which generally police officers are considered pretty reliable witnesses, but hey, humans are humans. Uh, but he seems like a good guy. But let's dig into it. Uh, this is also the one that apparently changed J. Allen Hynek's mind, who is the lead investigator of Project Blue Book. And it changed his mind on the whole UFO phenomenon, apparently. Story goes, a little after 5.45 p.m., April 24th, 1964, Sergeant Lonnie Zamora was chasing down a speeder in Socorro, New Mexico, when he heard a roar and saw a flame in the sky between half a mile and a mile away. Thinking maybe it was a crashed aircraft or maybe a storage shack of dynamite exploded, <laughs> which that's crazy. Apparently, does that happen a lot? I'm just curious. I'm just curious that that happens a lot. It'd be very, very interesting. Anyways. So thinking it was either a crashed plane or a shack of dynamite that exploded. So Mora decided to divert from the speeder that was clearly not as important as whatever this was. Uh, and so he made his way over there. On his way there, he could see a bluish orange flame that was descending slowly to the ground. The flame coming from uh, from the craft was like a funnel. So think about like a rocket coming down. So already my mind is going jet propelled. And he could hear the roar going from high pitch to low pitch. So if you've seen a rocket launch nowadays with SpaceX, seen them uh, you know, launch and take off and come back down, it's pretty impressive. It's very, very impressive. Now, back in 64, they weren't used to seeing things like that. But nowadays, we are. So to me, already, I'm going, that's a rocket launch, or in this case, one landing. But at the time, they supposedly didn't have that technology. We'll get into that. Zamora preach, uh, uh, preached, approached a steep hill to try and get to where this thing was, uh, and his vehicle couldn't get over the hill to the point where he had to attempt it three separate times. So by the time he got up the hill, the noise had stopped, and so he gets down, he's on this little road, and he sees a shiny object on the side of the road, around 200 yards ahead of him. At first, he thinks it might be an overturned car with two people standing next to it that he described as uh, either small adults or large kids wearing white coveralls standing next to it as if they were examining the vehicle and the surrounding area. So, he approaches slowly, and as he does, he starts getting the feeling that 
the car is not a car. It had an O shape like an egg and a white aluminum color with uh, a strange marking or insignia on it that he described as a crescent shaped with a arrow pointing up in the center and like a bar underneath it. And I'll get into that in more detail a little bit later. He goes back to the, uh, uh, before he gets out of the car, he radios in that he stopped and he's going to get out to investigate. That's what cops do. So anytime there's ever a depiction of cops getting out of their car and radio not knowing what there go- is going on, that doesn't happen. They always radio before they get out of the car saying, I'm getting out of the car in case something happens. So stops, radios in, gets out to investigate. As he does, the craft roars up again. Blue flame shoots out from underneath the craft. Zamora flings himself to the ground. And I want you to remember this detail that he flung himself to the ground. Right. Flung himself to the ground thinking it was an explosion. Moving to his patrol car. I'm assuming he's still on the ground. It doesn't say one way or the other if he got back up and then moved to the car or if he stayed down, and it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it comes into play later. The whole time keeping this thing in line of sight. Roar gets louder, craft starts rising into the air, and Zamora can clearly see it's a really smooth, oval-shaped craft with a red color insignia or symbol on the side, again, with this crescent shape, arrow, with a bar underneath. No no visible doors or windows. So he is on scene. This is his description. No visible doors or windows. Zamora gets behind the car. The craft hovering stationary 10, 15 feet in the air. Several seconds gets a really solid look at it. Then the craft takes off in a straight line away from him at he descri- as he describes at incredible speed. Zamora goes to his radio, rushes to his radio, sends a message to the operator, uh, who's Nep Lopez, asking him to look out the window, see if he can see anything over her head. Lopez does, doesn't see anything, tells Zamora. Sergeant Sam Chavez, who hears Zamora's calls over the radio, goes to where Zamora is to check on the situation. And when he gets there, he comments later that, he noticed how Zamora was, as he described, white as a plate. You know, most people say, like, white as a ghost and shit like that. But anyways, whatever. White as a plate. Both Zamora and Chavez investigate the area that now had, after the craft was there, now had burning brush, as they described, that was smoking with no flames. And Chavez spots eight distinct imprints Four of the indentations are large and rectangular, and the other four are smaller and round. So, like landing gear, right? All right, so Zamora claims he didn't notice any legs at the time. But remember, he came up on the hill right as the thing was taking off. So he didn't really see it land because he was a dumbass, tried to go over this hill apparently, uh, which And the car couldn't make it? Good Lord. But I'm thinking nowadays where every cop and their brother has got like a Range Rover. Fucking Porsche. Anyways. Uh, so within hours, this hits the press. Immediately putting score on the map. Brings UFO researchers uh, like APRO, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, which, by the way, were the same organization at the Travis Walton situation, which was like 67. Uh, NICAP, which is the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, sent Hynek from Project Blue Book 
which was who was their official investigator. Oh, I'm sorry. This was not Hynek. This was Ray Stanford. I apologize. Hynek was later. Stanford was first. I apologize. Okay. So U.S. Air Force sent Project Blue Book investigator Ray Stanford. Stan- uh, no, no, no. Jesus Christ. I sincerely apologize. NICAP sent Ray Stanford. Project Blue Book sent Hynek. All right. Now we're square. Okay. NICAP showed up first, Ray Stanford. First on the scene, interviewing witnesses. One of them from Albuquerque said that at 5.30 p.m., an oval object flying a very low altitude and relatively slow for its size, they say, heading towards Socorro. Several other witnesses claim they heard a loud roar at around the same time that Zamora claimed, but mind you, it was already in the press. Three other residents reported seeing a bright glowing object rising up in the sky also around the same time. Two days later, on the 26th, at just after 1 a.m., a local resident was apparently checking on his horses because something spooked him. And he said he witnessed something shaped like a butane tank landing on the ground nearby. So I'm thinking like one of those, um, well, like a tic-tac shape, but bigger. You know, like a propane, a big propane tank. I don't know why he said butane. Was butane used more often than propane then? I'm looking this up. Butane use in the 60s. Let's see. 1960s butane lighter. Butane lighter. Butane gas picnic stove. So I'm not sure if it was. uh, Well, now it's making me wonder. Is it is it small? Because it's making it out like a butane tank. So when I first looked at this, I immediately thought propane tank, like one of those big propane tanks, like a 100-gallon, whatever. But now it's making me think this guy's talking about a small, a small butane tank. I don't know. Anyways, landing uh, this butane tank-shaped thing landed on the ground nearby. That's according to this local resident on the 26th, just after 1 a.m., looking at his horses. When it took off again, the witness recalled seeing a blue-white flame, very similar to Zamora. In fact, I think that's his exact description of the flame, uh, on the underside of the craft and indentations on the ground, along with several smaller ones, rounder ones, and a burned circular patch on the ground. Very similar. But remember, we have to account for the fact that this could have been already absorbed by the public by this point. Just keep that in mind. Uh, When eventually, uh, let's see here, Zamora was the only police officer that actually witnessed the craft that we're talking about, the, the Zamora's craft. Several others, including Chavez, who did not see it, only saw Zamora what would testify to his state of shock and that they believed he did see something, but they never actually saw what he claimed to see. And even though these other people claim to have seen something, they could have been influenced by the media. So the only person, in my opinion, that I see as still a credible witness, and the one that we only have a name, the only one that's named, by the way, is Zamora. So to me, that makes a big deal. If you have the only named witness, these are all just no-name people that are coming forward. Oh, a resident. Oh, a random far- rancher. Put your name on it. It means more. Because now people can go and, and check it out. But now it's, what is it? It's like a fart in the wind. So, the FBI testified that there were 
four irregularly shaped smoldering areas on the ground, but no tracks of any kind to determine what kind of vehicle it may have been, aside from these imprints and smoldering areas. And of course, Zamora's tire tracks was was there, but there were no other tire tracks or anything like that. There was a situation to two people who are named were Larry Kratzner. That was a long pause. I blew a fuse. Larry Kratzner and Paul Keyes. Uh ended up stopping by a gas station owned by Opal Grinder nearby where the landing took place in Scora. And Opal Grinder went on record to the the Air Force that he didn't see this thing himself, but he told them about these two guys that came by the station and when there had just been a loud boom right when these two guys came in and whatever they were there for, Twinkies, whatever. Uh, They stopped there to shop. They were getting some goods. They commented on how, wow, aircraft flies really low around here. And then Mr. Grinder replies that a lot of helicopters are pretty common. And the two guys say, well, it was a funny looking helicopter if that's what it was. So, Grinder tells the Air Force this. And they end up getting the statements from Kratzner and Keyes. A research UFO researcher, Ralph DeGraw, ended up interviewing these guys. And by the way, we don't know what their statements were to the Air Force. We just know that that's what Grinder told the Air Force. So, these two guys, uh, a UFO researcher, DeGraw, ends up interviewing these guys, or at least Kratzner, in 1978. Mind you, that's 14 years later. And Katzner claims that he saw a black, a cloud of black smoke coming from the ground in front of them to the right, like on the road and saw a round saucer or egg-shaped object with several windows. Mind you, Zamora was right in front of it and saw no windows. So either that means that it was a different angle, so maybe the other side of the craft, this guy seeing it from maybe the uh, you know one side or the other. So he sees several windows and also sees an insignia, but in his case, it's a red Z. And it ends up ascending vertically out of this black smoke. Army Captain Richard T. Holder, who was uh, the senior most officer at White Sands Base, New Mexico. Keep in mind that place, there's a lot of fuckery going on at White Sands. So he's the most senior officer there at White Sands, along with Arthur Burns end up going and interviewing, oh, from the uh, FBI. Arthur Burns is from the FBI. Goes and interviews Zamora on April 25th, so the day after this happened. During the interview, Zamora says that he saw that what he witnessed these are his words, was a secret experimental craft. He didn't say not an alien, but he said a secret experimental craft. Captain Dick Holder, get it, Richard Dick, <laughs> witness uh, dismissed it immediately, goes out of his way to tell the press The military has no object that can compare to what Zamora described. Now think about that. It's an egg-shaped or an oval-shaped object that had jet propulsion and the uh, 
and landing gear. I'm going to look something up real, real quick. The U.S. Flying Saucer. The VZ-9 Avra car is what it was called. Uh, I'm trying to find a date here. Trying to find a date here. Damn it, when was the date? Yeah, that's right. It was in the 1950s. In the 50s. In the 1950s is when it was going on. This is 1964. Now, all all you got to do is have an insignia on it that's not U.S. government. Yeah, in 1952, they started that project. The VZ-9AV Avrogar. And they say the project was canceled in 1961. How much you want to bet? How much do you want to bet it simply went black budget? It didn't go away. It just went black budget. How much you want to bet? So, that's going to have landing gear. Who knows how much? Could have been eight. And uh, and then the insignia, well, we can speculate about that, which we're going to do after a little bit. But let's, go, let's continue on with uh, the descriptions and all that. So again, he says that he witnessed a secret experimental craft. Zamora, police officer, the closest witnessed witness to this actual landing and taking off of this craft. The closest witness. And in fact, the only named witness who actually says this craft. And in my opinion, the most believable testimony the other ones with the black smoke and the windows and the and all that i mean who knows i mean when they stopped in then they talked to uh to what was his name uh grinder they didn't say anything about that they said well it was a funny looking helicopter nothing about black smoke come on and then 14 years later now you've got People asking you about it, a UFO researcher who is like, hey, you know, we're going to put this in a book. Oh, well, let me spice it up a little bit. So I am leaning on the side of believing Zamora in this, that what he saw, what he described is accurate to what he described and that he is saying it, a secret experimental craft. And remember, the dick holder is immediately dismissing it, saying that they have nothing. When at the very time, or right before this, they had that going on, uh, the timing of this. So they he can honestly say, no, we don't have any object that compares to that. Except in black budgets. And that wasn't even given out to the public until like 2007. When that thing even was, like I said, when people even knew about it. So, after the interview with Samora, almost immediately, using flashlights because it's at night, Dick Holder and, and Burns go out to the landing site and quickly create a barrier around the area and take samples. Blocking off everybody. In the 1968 book, Fight for UFO Science, James McDonald claimed that a sample of fused sand was taken by the military and that a contact in Las Vegas in the Public Health Service or Public Health Department which some sources vary on this, that some sources name her, some others don't. Some, so some say the, uh, the name is Mary Mays, but 
who really knows? And this is none of this is verified, by the way. This what this James McDonald is saying. But he claims in this book that this fused sand was removed and taken to Mary Mays at the Las Vegas Public Health Service, who was a uh, radiological chemist, and that she, uh, when she went to the site, she found a solid glass area right under the landing site. But yet that was never reported by Zamora. That was never reported by Chavez, the other guy who was there. It was never reported by Dick Holder, who obviously is a uh, a government stooge, and so is Burns, so we don't expect much from them, but Zamora never said anything about that. But this guy... James McDonald apparently found that. So he also claims that shortly after this Mary Mays finished her work, which again, she may or may not exist, or that may or may not be her real name, Air Force personnel came and took all of her notes, all the materials, all the evidence, telling her she couldn't talk about it anymore. But we can't verify any of that. The only thing we can verify in any of this is Zamora's, which even that, we can't really verify. But based on his description, based on his, him being, he just seems like a good guy. Random cop chasing down speeders in Zocoro, New Mexico, decides he's going to go save some lives after a plane crash or a potential dynamite shack explosion. Somebody could be in trouble. Timmy could be stuck in a well. So he goes check it out out of the goodness of his heart, and he sees the most extraordinary thing doesn't attribute it to aliens, does not attribute it to anything supernatural doesn't go there with it. He doesn't add a bunch of crazy, whatever, I don't know what you want to call it, aesthetics to the story. Like the black smoke, this this other guy, Kratzner, said. He just straight up says, I caught, I lost sight of it going up the hill because I'm a loser and I couldn't get my car up. When I see it, this is what it looked like. It looked like an experimental craft. So then, J. Allen Hynek from Blue Book, Project Blue Book, shows up, purposely or not, who knows, but he didn't get there until four days after the incident. And according to his notes on the case, four days after, there was a conflict of interest between the truth of like, well, what at least what Zamora was saying, which that's what, in this case, that's what most people believe the truth is, and then what the Air Force's investigation angle was. And he also noted that Zamora and Chavez, who were the two cops that were the first on scene, Zamora then Chavez, and remember, Chavez never really saw it, but either way, were very anti-Air Force at this point because the Air Force was accusing Zamora and Chavez of making up uh, uh, a hoax. And keep in mind, this is a tactic used by the CIA to discredit independent investigators, a.k.a. conspiracy theorists. Oh, it's a hoax. Oh, it's misinformation. Oh, it's di- it's it's disinformation. Oh, da, da, da. This is why everything is so confusing. This is why nobody can get a straight answer on anything, especially within the government. But this is a tactic. This, oh, it's a hoax. Oh, they're lying, whatever. What reason, and, and again, we'll kind of get into the theories, but I'm going to ask right now. What reason, so make your, think about this, keep this in your mind. What reason 
would two cops, Zamora and Chavez, who I would assume have no history of lying. I'm assuming I don't know that. But based on their careers and whatever, we can, you can speculate all day about their character. Based on what we know, we have no reason to assume they're lying assholes. But what reason do they have to lie? And if it was experimental, the CIA, the FBI, the Air Force has every reason to cover it up, make up stories about it, or discredit the witnesses. Or all three, a combo meal. But it got to the point where Zamora was so pissed off at all this fuckery going on by the government that he wouldn't even talk to Heineck because he was from the government. And this apparently is when Heineck started to suspect that there might be something to this UFO phenomenon, or at least in this case, there was something to this case. And that the military and the Pentagon and the U.S. government, despite what they were telling the public with the Project Blue Book and whatnot, that they were not interested in finding or releasing the truth of this situation or any other to the public. And the truth in this situation, again, if we take Zamora's account as genuine, and accurate and truthful, his words, his words, were that it looked like an ex- a secret experimental craft. And Dick Holder dismissed it immediately. Government stooge swoops in and says, no, 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 no. It can't be that. He'd rather him have said UFOs. Right? Because then he would just say, oh, well, we don't, it was a weather balloon. But now all of a sudden he's got to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't have anything like that. Because from a cop, a cop would logically, people are going to be like, well, if the cop says it was experimental graft. See how I'm getting at? Now, Hynek's feelings from this. And this is what a lot of people do. They immediately think, like uh, most people in this just dismiss, completely leave out Zamora's secret experimental craft aspect. They go immediately to UFOs because as soon as you say secret experimental craft, they go, well, no one in the world has anything like that. So there it is. It has to be UFOs. You don't know that. We have no idea. Heineck's feelings were that the Air Force doesn't know what science is. And then he put in its notes that he thought in this case that the Socorro, New Mexico was the, could be the Rosetta Stone of UFO cases. He said there's never been a strong case, stronger case, with such as he puts an unimpeachable witness. I believe, yes, Zamora is a great witness. But the fact that everybody pushes this to UFOs and aliens, I think is just you're you're skipping over, in my opinion, the most logical case, which is that it is a secret experimental craft, that it was this VR... V9, Avrov, whatever. Oval-shaped rocket, jet propulsion. That doesn't sound alien. It's metallic. I, I mean, in my mind, aliens are going to be so alien you can barely comprehend it because in order to either interdimensional travel Cosmos, travel through the cosmos, whatever the case may be. You would have to be a supreme being to be able to do what people claim these aliens do. Because we 
have rocket propulsion. We have jet propulsion. We have great jet propulsion. Phenomenal. Look at SpaceX. We're, do you, we're using nuclear propulsion now in space and whatnot. And we're not, any, well, supposedly we're not anywhere out there. But so now we're going to say, oh, but aliens now could could get to us using jet propulsion. Okay. That doesn't make sense to me. Again, the witness, the unimpeachable witness that makes for a strong case said secret government tech. Isn't this strong evidence of an attempt to cover up the truth behind secret government tech, not aliens? And you can argue all day about, well, where are they getting the secret tech? Where are they getting the government technology? Could it be from aliens? Could it be reverse tech, reverse engineered? And now, and then we're going down the Bob Lazar trail, and I don't believe that. But I don't believe Bob Lazar for a moment. I believe he's a, an overglorified janitor that had to have top clearance to even get through the fucking door. He was brought in by boss. They're not going to bring in top grade scientists that are compartmentalized in the government. Top secret, top fucking secret in a fucking school bus with blacked out windows. Give me a break. You're, they're going to fly them in. They're going to fly them in. Secret planes, people. Come on. My opinion, my opinion, as, as dumb and idiotic as I am because I am a complete dumbass, but that's what it. that's what I'm getting from this is that Zamora is spot on, spot fucking on. It is secret government tech, not aliens. And, and of course, researchers, as I said, they always say there's no known craft available. Nothing fits this description. Ryan Graves says this. Oh, there's nothing. The world, no one in the world has anything like this. No one in the world. I am convinced that only a handful, a very select handful of people, let's say a group of evil fucks who call themselves elite, actually know what kind of advanced tech is in the world. The CIA. Nobody knows what those motherfuckers are up to. Nobody knows. So now moving on to the insignia, the logo, the symbol on the side of the craft that we had talked about. The Z, uh, Krasner, Kratzner said it was a Z shape, mind you, 14 years later. Zamora said it was a crescent shape, an upward arrow pointed inside a crescent, crescent over the arrow, and a horizontal bar underneath the two of them. Two very, very different descriptions. But again, could it have been two different sides of the craft? Also, Kratzner said he saw windows. But again, Samoros was the same day. The same day he's talking about this, and the day after. Kratzner's was 14 years later. The day after Zamora, uh, in one of the interviews he did, he said with Walter Schrode at KSRC Radio in Socorro, when asked about the symbol the next day, mind you, uh, oh yeah, yeah, so the next day he tells this Walter Schrode, no sir, I couldn't tell you about the markings, they don't want me to say anything about it. All of a sudden, he clams up. Zamora claimed, this is where I I have a hard time believing this, Zamora claimed that he was able to sketch out a drawing 
of the craft, what he saw, and the symbol. Remember when I asked you to keep in mind that he was hit the ground and I didn't know if he stayed on the ground when he got back to his car or if he got up and moved back to his car. But sometime in that period, when he was either on the ground and moving back to his car or once he got back to the car, not sure when, apparently he was able to sketch out this thing. I don't... I mean, cops carry around notepads, so I I guess if you don't have a camera, I mean, I don't know. I barely remember to pull out my phone to take a picture, let alone remember to doodle a description of what I'm seeing. So I don't know. But anyways, that's the only thing out of Zamora's account that I'm like, I don't know. But either way, clammed up about it when he was talking on the radio. So we don't know, but he was forthcoming about this with other people. But apparently after the government got to him, nothing. And he was doing his duty, I'm sure. As a cop, they were like, look, man, you can't be talking like this. He's like, all right. So here's where I'm getting out with the symbol. Depending on which angle... These two people, Zamora and Kratzner, assuming they're both telling the truth. Assuming, or or depending on which angle they saw them. Two symbols on each side. So they didn't see, I'm thinking they didn't see the same symbol. Because again, Kratzner saw windows, supposedly. Zamora did not. Could it have been with the Z, a swastika from a weird angle? Think about that. And then Zamora symbol, if you look at the what's called the straf bar symbol from Nazism or whatever you want to call it, it's a circle around it with kind of like a V shape in the circle with almost like a lightning bolt. I don't know. I Look, I always tie this stuff into Nazis. You're looking at 1945 is when the war ended. Operation Paperclip was going on during that time from 1945 to who knows when. My theory is the that this is Nazi technology like the Nazi bell carried over from World War II with projects like Operation Alsos, where which was the U.S. government was eyeballing nuclear tech and probably all tech advancements of the Nazis during the war. Operations to hire Nazi scientists all over the world like Overcast and Paperclip that was in the U.S., the Ozafi Him or whatever it's called in Russia, Epsilon in the UK, and Rust in France. All of this was operation to bring Nazis out of Germany to work in these countries. So think about how much technology was being pulled out of the Nazi regime during that time. And and I'm very, very convinced that there was something to do with this, with the Roswell crash, because in both instances, there are are witnesses that report there being symbols. Now, nobody said they were Nazi symbols, but the Nazis had some pretty weird symbolism that may not have been, like, generally known. I mean, shit, a lot of that stuff wasn't even generally known until much later anyways. So, that's my theory. That potentially what they were seeing is remnants of Nazi technology that we captured after the war and were still utilizing. And that's why he said secret government graft, because he thought he recognized it somewhere, and that was probably it. 
I don't know. I don't know. But why wouldn't he say alien? Why wouldn't he say alien? If it's so far, like most people will say, well, because it was so far out of what we have. But to him, it was far enough outside of what the U. he thought the U.S. had to be an experimental craft, but not so far out to have been alien. That's what I find fascinating. He was still thinking terrestrial. It was still that recognizable to him that he, it didn't push his brain into the outside the box. He was still inside the box. See what I'm saying? Uh, during this 12-minute interview with Zamora that he had on the radio with uh, Schrode, Schrode said that many of the residents in Socorro were convinced that something landed that day and what Zamora thought of that. And Zamora, again, said nothing about the object being from outer space or alien. He was very clear that it was something he had not seen before. He didn't say in this interview with Schrode that it was an experimental graph. That's what he told the Air Force. So did the Air Force tell him, you're not allowed to say anything about experimental. You just have to say you've never seen it before. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. And again, all of this makes me lean towards classified government projects, not aliens. I'm not saying I don't believe in aliens. I don't know what the fuck is out there. Out there in deep space, whatever, on Jupiter. Uh, what I mean, I, there, I'm sure there is life everywhere. But as far as what's here... Interacting with us, landing in New Mexico and shit, I'm not convinced it's aliens. I think it's government shenanigans. I really, really do. A lot of skeptics and debunkers say that it was something very easily explained, like... Uh, this guy, Donald Menzel, who's a Harvard astronomer, he believes that Zamora was a victim of a hoax that was done by high school kids that wanted to trick Zamora. And so they set up some complex prank. But no one ever came forward. No one ever has come forward to take credit for that. And at this point, even, uh, even if I was... Dude, I would totally take credit for a hoaxer of that. Even if I was an asshole, it's like wrestlers, right? Even if you're the bad guy, it's still fun. So be the hoaxer, man. Have people be like, you fuck, you piece of shit, you fooled everybody. But dude, your name is still going down in the books, bro. As a complete douchebag. So if you can live with that, you know. But again, no one ever has come forward to take credit for that. And on top of that, the general thought from people who were interviewed around town, because mind you, several UFO enthusiasts did, or researchers, and the FBI did, the uh, Air Force did, I'm sh the press did. The entire area believed it was a legit sighting. But again, there were several residents who believed they saw something. And even amongst the teens, it was generally thought of to be a genuine sighting. Uh, uh, but we can't rule out lies and exaggerations. You cannot rule that out. People will be people. So just, it's human nature. People want to be a part of something bigger. So they will lie in cases sometimes to do that and make shit up. Another uh, UFO skeptic, River, uh, I'm sorry, Philip Class, said that Zamora saw ball lightning. 
And even though some of the cases I do believe ball lightning is uh, the culprit or could be potential, in this case, with everything Zamora saw from the rockets to the landing gear to the imprints uh, to uh, literally everything, the roar, there is no way that was ball lightning. And on top of that, even scientifically, they could never replicate it or support that idea. But that didn't stop him. Class came back at him again at Zamora. This time, bringing in the idea that with the help of the mayor of Socorro, <laughs> Socorro, yeah, Socorro, uh, Holm Bursum Jr., that they invented up the story to put Socorro on the map, which it did put Socorro on the map. So that is, like I said in the beginning, a valid argument. I mean, look at Roswell. Look at Area 51. These areas are on the map as massive tourist attractions now as opposed to tiny New Mexico towns. And Socorro is one of them. So, and I'll tell you what, money is a hell of a motivator. So I, I don't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. But they didn't gain much. Like Zamora, Zamora doesn't seem like he gained much out of this. And I would say this Coro, I don't know if that's as big on the map as far as like UFO tourist attractions as Roswell and Area 51. So I'm not sure that that one worked out. If that's the case, it certainly didn't work out, I think, the way that they would want it to. But there's really no way of knowing. That's the worst part about a lot of these. There's no way of knowing if there's fuckery involved between Zamora and this Bursum guy, the mayor. If there was, I, it's hard to know. And again, money is a big motivator, but it doesn't seem like there was a lot of money involved. And same as a prank, we'll never know until somebody comes forward. Then there was the standby good old weather balloon or hot air balloon explanation, but again, uh, doesn't explain any of the details like the roar or the landing gear, nothing, nothing. So we throw that one out immediately. Um, there is some, so like one of the things is Zamoro mentioned that, uh, the dust was flying around when the object was landing and taking off. And he wasn't sure if it was windy or if it was from the craft, it was the, you know, whatever powered it. There's some cert, a research that shows that the wind, there was a lot of wind that night and that it could have possibly drug a weather balloon into the area. Or I'm sorry, no, it doesn't. It says that the object was moving southwest and that the wind was moving in the opposite direction. So it couldn't have been. It could not have been that. It could not have been the wind dragging a balloon into the area because the wind was going in the opposite direction. And on top of that, of course, Samora says the craft landed in one place, rose straight up, and then hovered for several seconds. So if it was the wind, even if it wasn't the wind, a weather balloon, it's not going to act like that unless it's being controlled. So then who's controlling it? Well, the government, if it's a weather balloon. And in this case, I believe it is as well. But In this case, Zamora is just saying this is a craft. It landed and then it took off. And again, in the case of weather balloon, it does not account for the landing gear. The 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 imprints of what may have been landing gear doesn't account for a weather balloon's not going to leave scorch marks. And unlike a lot of skeptics and debunkers. 
I don't think this was a hoax. I don't think it was a publicity stunt. I definitely don't think it was a balloon, and I definitely don't think it was ball lightning. When I look at this case with no bias, and that's how I try and look at it, I don't want it to be aliens. I don't want it to be government. I don't want it to be anything. I want it to be what it is because it, it just is what it is. And when I look at it that way, based on Zamora's statements about the craft, what he believes it is, again, a secret experimental craft, the dismissal by Captain Dick Holder, the, uh, the scorch marks, evidence of jet propulsion, the, the fact that he saw a plume, The roar, the metallic egg shape, this is screaming secret experimental craft. Advanced government tech. And this isn't even that advanced. It's fucking a rocket on a on a on an oval shape. That's it. So maybe in 1964 it was advanced, but now. Dude, we have drone cars. We have cars that are on four propellers that now people are going to have flying cars. That is nothing. A jet propulsion, oval-shaped egg thing. That's not aliens. That is so human, it's ridiculous. That's exactly what a human would think a spaceship would look like, especially in 1964. That's why they were building flying saucers. So the Air Force came out with two reports regarding this. The first went to the public, highlighting errors throughout the investigation, like several witnesses that weren't spoken to, inadequate documentation and photographs of the landing site. And all this resulted in a no conclusion. That was to the public. Then a second report by Major Hector Quintanilla, the director of Project Blue Book, was not given to the public until the 2000s. And it originally went to the CIA. Again, The CIA, I'm telling you, they're the people. This report said there was no question that Samora saw something, that they considered him a reliable witness, but that they had no idea what the vehicle was. And as I pointed out earlier, I don't think majors or even generals necessarily know what kind of technology is really out there in the world. It's these fucks that think they run everything. The CIA and and the ones that pull the strings in that realm. The, The people you never hear about, the agencies you never see, the budgets you never get, those are the real motherfuckers. The questions, it seems, that we're always left with is if it's aliens, why land in Socorro, New Mexico? Why Earth? Why humans? Always, always my questions. And if it's secret government technology, not aliens, again, why Socorro? And what's it all for? This technology, this use and abuse of technology that they have, that they just spend trillions of dollars on that we never get. We're still doing batteries for fuck's sakes. 
Batteries are some of the oldest technology. There were batteries in the pyramids. Are they going to use this technology to take over humanity? Or is it eventually, hopefully, going to be used for the enlightenment of humanity? That's the hope. That's my hope. That it is for the betterment. Because otherwise, we're all fucked. You know what I mean? But as always, I want to know what you think. I want to know. I want to know uh, what you think about all this. If you have stories. If you have experiences. You just want to reach out. Call or text 208-477-1288. You can also email. I want to believe 115 at gmail.com. And of course, as I said before, every single episode is brought to you by the amazing, amazing Tinfoil Militia members who support this podcast. And here they are. I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil Militia. Stop, militia! The Tinfoil Militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter, designer, tinfoil hat wearing Aaron Rice. What happened to my deal? What happened to my deal? It went away. Why did it go away? Oh, bummer. Anyways, I just want to make sure this goes. Okay, there we go. Uh... Casey Armadillo, I'm going to start over. Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter, designer, tinfoil hat wearing, Aaron Rice, Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, Nathan Boldly Gone Higby, out there in the field searching for the blind one, and of course our very own Edwin Everhart with his podcast, Strange Circumstances, you should absolutely check out. I love every single one of these people. They support this podcast because of them. We keep doing this shit, and you can be a part of this as well. All you got to do is you got to click that link in the show notes. The portal to all things UFO know to donate, buy merch, listen to all the episodes, and uh, all kinds of other stuff. Check it out. Make sure to check out our partners, Clarkston CBD Co. for excellent CBD products. Uh, scribed, great audible uh, audible alternative. Again, fourteen ninety five access to the entire library. Clarkston CBD Company for excellent CBD products. Uh, scribed, I already went into that. <laughs> I did the. Oh my god. Uh, Buzz Sprout, start your own podcast, and then of course, as I've said, buy us a Romulan ale now. We're waiting for our first one. We want it. I have it. We want to drink it. Let's do this. It's illegal in most the galaxy. So. Fucking A. Come on, guys. Uh, click the link in the description. Join the growing list of tinfoilists. The tinfoil militia get ad-free episodes, rewards for tier members, chat with us directly on Discord, and access bonus episodes each and every single week. Plus, like I said, all my loyalty, baby. Uh, remember, sharing is caring, so spread us like gospel. Just take that URL and slap it anywhere you want. You can find me on Twitch. During the weekdays, I generally Twitch uh, games. I've been playing a lot of Elder Scrolls lately. Uh, you can find our friend Bill. He does the bonus episodes with me on Patreon. You can find him on Twitch as well, Blitz86. And then, uh, like I said, go check out Ed's podcast, Strange Circumstances. And then uh, we'll be back, baby, next week. Next week, a brand new episode again. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but it's going to be phenomenal. Ed should be back for another one. And uh, I love you all. Thank you so much. Get merch. Be a tinfoilist. Join the cool kids. And remember, stay elevated. Keep your eyes to the skies and watch out for the government. They're shoisty bastards. Bye, 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 bye.